Arindir. <laughs> Arindir. <laughs> he put it in uh, Google Translate and uh, he got Mithraud out. I'm not dropping no E's, Master Gandalf. And visit Durin. <laughs> There's a bug. No. Mithril. Can we talk a little uh, Elrond gossip? All right, take uh, 17. <laughs> you can all go back to Valinor, because I have all this power. You can cut this part out. Um, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? There it is. Oh, it was on your thumb. <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. Oh. Yes. Got yes. It. We got it. We got it. That'll be a wrap for us. Thanks for watching <laughs> this week. We're done. Welcome to Across the Sunring Seas. I'm Zach Hudspeth. And I'm Nathan Dewberry. In this episode, we will talk about the Rings of Power, episode four. We will be joined by Tolkien scholar and language expert, Dr. Andrew Higgins. So put on your elf ears as we dive deep into all the lore of this episode. Dr. Andrew Higgins. I am an independent scholar. Um, by day, I am actually the director of development at Imperial War Museums here in London. I got my PhD in Tolkien at Cardiff Metropolitan University. Here it is right here. I work with a wonderful Tolkien scholar author um, named Dr. Dimitri Fimi, um, who I later went on to co-edit the book, A Secret Vice, Tolkien on Language Invention which was Tolkien's talk, his November 1931 talk on the art or the secret vice of language invention. And since then, I've been working on turning this bad boy into a book and doing other papers on Tolkien. I'm also very interested in invented languages, Star Trek, Star Wars, High Valerian, Klingon, uh, you name it. Uh, and I've done some papers on that and have two chapters forthcoming in books on Star Wars and Star Trek languages. My love of Tolkien uh, really started when I was a young boy. My father read my brother and I, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings when I was about seven. My father was a member of the New York Tolkien Society um, and he had copies of the Tolkien Journal all around the house and things like that. And so I kind of grew up with Tolkien. Um, I became very interested in a lot of the academic pursuits that Tolkien did. So I taught myself Old English and Old Norse. And I went to um, college and I became a classics major and I majored in Greek and Latin and Sanskrit, worked on philology a bit. And then when I, and that was in the States, I grew up in New York City, um, started in the opera profession. I worked at several major opera houses, moved here to England in 2001 to work at English National Opera. And that's when I started keeping a blog on Tolkien. And I was very interested in Tolkien's languages. And I had taught myself pretty much everything you could teach yourself about Quenya and Sindarin and the black language and some of the Manish languages. And I started keeping a blog. And at that time I started taking, I took an online course with Dr. Dimitri Fimi um, on Tolkien. And she recognized very early on that I was very interested in the languages. And she said, well, why don't you try to do some serious work on this? Why don't you do a PhD with me? And I said, all right, well, I'm going to work on Tolkien anyway. So why don't I get a degree while doing it as well? So I worked on it. And what we decided to do really was look at the earliest version of Tolkien's mythology in the Book of Lost Cows. The first time, literally right out of World War I, when Tolkien, start, Tolkien started building this world, basically. And I was very interested in the early languages. And it was by doing that, I got permission to go to the Bodleian and look at a lot of the unpublished academic papers. And that's when Demetra and I kind of worked together on shaping what was then known as Tolkien MS-24, which was the folder on A Secret Vice, the talk that he'd given. No one knew when this talk had been given. Christopher published it in 1983 in Monsters and Critics, but there was never a date. 
And so our whole journey with those manuscripts was to come up with a book that HarperCollins would publish. And we actually discovered when the talk was given. It was given on in November 1931 to the Samuel Johnson Student Society of Pembroke College, Oxford. So Tolkien was a kind of young academic at the time. And he, he told students he was going to give a talk called A Secret Vice, which I think he did to basically get students there. And then he kind of basically let the cat out of the bag and told them it was going to be about language invention, which he had been doing, as Dr. Flieger said in the, in the last episode, since he was a boy. Um, and that's how Secret Vice came to, came to be, basically. And it was an amazing opportunity to work with one of the best Tolkien scholars we have today, Dr. Dimitri Fimi, who has now gone on to actually establish the first center for fantasy and speculative fiction at Glasgow University. To kind of set the ground rules right now, I mean, basically, I believe, I, I have a very kind of pragmatic way of dealing with this, these things. The books are the books. The books are not going to go away. I'm reading the history of Middle Earth again for the third time all the way through. That They're never going to go away. Tolkien's work are never going to go away. But adaptations are an interesting way to see Tolkien from a, in a different prism, through a different lens, basically. And also, you know, as we saw with the Jackson films, you know, our, I'm a member of the Tolkien Society in the UK, which I encourage anyone to join. It's an amazing organization. Um, our membership went up when those Peter Jackson films came out because people wanted to learn more about Tolkien. So again, if it gets people to the books, that's great. I'm also involved with Signum University as well. And you know that was started by Dr. Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor, to encourage the exploration of Tolkien and other authors as well. So in this last 10, 15 years, we've seen an amazing growth in scholarship for Tolkien, and that includes adaptation. And I see Amazon's Rings of Power as another version of that. What is, has been your watch schedule like for the show do you stay up well i was very lucky because i got to go to the rings of power premiere in london uh, with the tolkien society so i i saw the first two episodes in the theater with all the celebrities there well you know all morford clark robert arameo they were all there basically including jeff bezos which i found very excited usually it will be friday nights when i get home from work because what i don't like is going on social media as I did tonight with House of the Dragons, I had to watch the episode because all of a sudden all this stuff is coming out. And I'm like, I don't want to see it. So I'll, I'll try to pretty close to the drop date. I'll watch it once all the way through with, with subtitles. And then I watch it again. And actually, because I knew I was talking about episode four for you guys, I watched it again this afternoon in between the Queen's funeral and everything, which was, which was incredibly moving and sad and poignant but I took a little break and I watched episode four again. So we are recording this on on Monday, um, September 19th. The The Queen's funeral was today. Yes, and it was very, very moving. And the, this whole period, uh, I mean, the, the, I mean, it's amazing that people just, it was almost like Canterbury's Tales again. I mean, people went on this pilgrimage to go see, see her lying in state and everything. It was very, very moving, very medieval. I mean, the... The, the ritual at the end in Windsor Castle is something we've never seen before when they break the rod and all that kind of stuff. It, it felt very Game of Thrones in many ways and Tolkien. The episode starts with what we find out we think is a dream, but it turns out it's them looking into the seeing stone. And what's so cool about that is Tolkien had a recurring dream throughout his life of a great wave rising up out of the green, you know, rising out of the country. And so what's the first thing that we see in that episode with Tom Muriel is she's having a dream of the great wave coming up. I thought that was really exciting. I heard that they, that he, he wrote it into the Lord of the Rings and him writing it into the story is kind of how he got rid of the recurring nightmare, which is amazing. Yeah. He did that in a letter. Yep. Absolutely. He called it his Atlantis dream. And of course, Numenor is, I mean, you know, it's obviously, it has, it has motivation from Atlantis, you know, the things like that. So yeah, yeah. So I love the way that started when I saw that that was a dream. Cause I was like, oh my God, are we at that point already? Well, you know, we can't be there yet, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm sure we'll see that several times given the amount of money they must have spent on shooting that scene. What do you think about the timeline? 
We're obviously condensing it. What are your thoughts? I think as Dr. Flieger said in the, in the last episode too, certain choices have to be made in terms of narrative because you're dealing with a different type of medium. And, you know, and, and what they got to work with, of course, is the appendices to Lord of the Rings, a bit of the unfinished tales. And I think they, you know, they probably had to go to the estate to get very specific permission about other things. Clearly, they had to compress the timeline. Otherwise, we would have to have different generations of men, basically. So you can't just go into the tales of the years and try to map the series onto that. What they're doing with Farazan and Tarmiriel and everything certainly is they're leading up to that end part of the history of Numidor before the downfall, certainly. But Sauron hasn't come into, ha, well, we don't think he's come on the, on, uh, I think there's lots of red herrings, Hal Brand, for example, but I think what they're doing is they're kind of, they're kind of going towards the end of the timeline for the second age, but then they, I think they're going to work back a bit and start adding some things from earlier. Clearly, they can't do anything earlier in terms of the Numenor kings, like doing the story of Arendis and Aldarion, because those kings have already passed. But I think we're going to get some of the earlier events of the chronology later on. Let's face it, they have to fill five years here. You know, there's a lot of material to go. So I think... I mean, it was interesting at the end of this episode, we're not worried about spoilers, right? We're assuming everyone has seen the That's episode. Right. So they're, they're, they're sailing off now to the Southland. So if you kind of map that onto the chronology with Farazan, in the, in the chronology, that's when Farazan, you know, puts Sauron in chains and drags him back to Numenor. And that's when Sauron starts to seduce Numenor, basically. So are we going to have a situation where Galadriel and Tarmiriel are going to go to the Southlands and in some way imprison Sauron? Or is Sauron already in Numenor? Halbrand? I, I don't know. But there's going to be that. There has to be a point where the Numenorians, and I think it's very interesting that his daughter is part of the building guild because of certainly... One of the things that happens is when Sauron starts to seduce the Numenorians, they build temples to Morgoth and all that, Melkor Morgoth and all that. So I think they're playing around with that a bit. But if we're going to follow the timeline, at some point, a Sauron type creature is going to have to come to Numenor. Isildur is on the boat and he hears voices. He hears a woman's voice. Who, who could that be, do you think? Well, we don't know a lot about his mother. So I'm wondering if there's something there, because what he's looking at is the mental karma too. So that's where, that's the only, one of the few places in all of Tolkien's Middle Earth where there is a temple to Alubitar, to Eru, basically. So is he, because I, I, when I first saw that, I thought he that they were facing, Val, they were facing the West, like they were facing Valinor. And I thought, is he being tempted? Because of course the ban of the Valar is that you cannot sail to the uttermost west. I mean, that eventually what causes the destruction. I also uh, looked up, maybe it's um, this character, uh, it's a, a Maiar, um, U-I-N-E-N. So that's an interesting one. And Corey Olson did a really good thing on that on his Rings and Realms um, show, which is brilliant. And that is, that's you, I could never pronounce it, Yuinin, who is a goddess of the sea and actually where Galadriel and Halbrand are jailed up, where they're in jail, you'll notice there's a big statue. That's of Uinen, basically. But she's been put in a cellar. She's been imprisoned almost, which I can't find interesting. So she was a goddess of the sea, basically, that the Numenorians have suppressed, like they've suppressed everything with the elves and you know stuff like that. So yeah, there could be there could be an interesting link there, definitely. And that's what I kind of like about the series. It's bringing characters that, let's face it, for a lot of people, you know, for those who haven't read the books, they're probably their only reference point is the Peter Jackson prologue, you know. And when you see Isildur, for example, and see what he becomes and what he does, you know, no spoilers, and you see this young, you know, young guy, you know, on the ship and everything, and you think he has to become that character, you know, eventually, as does Elendil, and we haven't seen Anarion yet, but Anarion as well. So it'll be interesting, again, to see the arc to how the, well, even Galadriel. I mean, we know 
We know the Cate Blanchard Galadriel. We know the Galadriel of the Third Age. That's quite different from the Morpheth Clark Galadriel right now, who's pacing around her jail cell. Like a cult. Yeah, like a cult. Do not compare me to a horse. <laughs> what are your thoughts on Hal Brennan? Well, I just kind of wrote down all of, a lot of his quotes, right? So the one we've already said, identify what is your opponent. Identify that, uh, what your opponent most fears, not to exploit it, but a means of mastering it so that you can master them. And then... He says to Galadriel, the tides of fate are flowing. Yours might be heading in or out. Um, he tells her looks could be deceiving. He says, yeah. I suspect finding safety won't be that easy, especially not for you. Um, he talks about his people not having a king. He says that he has been searching for his peace far longer than you know. Yeah. Uh, and then he says, be careful, elf. The heir to this mark is heir to more than just nobility. Yeah. He says, I am not the hero you seek. He claims to be a great smith as well. And he has anger issues. We know that. He broke that guy's arm. And then in the Cimmerillion, uh, Sauron was briefly a prisoner of Numenor before becoming one of its most trusted um, counselors. And I kind of saw some of that in, in the uh, jail sale, right? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, and when he's talking to Farazhan and stuff, I think it's too obvious, though. I think if that's the case... Either they're trying to really fake us out or it's true. I personally don't think Hal Brand is Sauron. I think they're dropping too many red herrings. Like that, that, you know, when he says to Gladriel, you know, find the thing and then master them. Well, I mean, come on. That it's so obvious that Sauron, that it, it can't be Sauron. I could be made to eat my words there, but I don't think it is. I don't think we've seen Sauron. I think Sauron is the end of season big reveal. We then jump uh, to see Adar. Everybody's bowing down to him as he comes out and then he kneels down next to the, the wounded orc and he kind of gently, but you know, still killed him, puts him out of his misery. Uh, I saw some real emotion in what's supposed to be a bad guy there. Mm -hmm. He looks genuinely sad yeah. and genuinely like morose that that he had to kill. I mean, he's being called father, so I guess you could call them his sons, you know, right. if you wanted to go with that. Adar, I think is, so So we go back to one of the theories of how the orcs became orcs. Told, you know, Morgoth perverted elves. He caught, he captured elves. I mean, Tolkien, of course, went back and forth on this, but basically early, in the early version of the mythology, orcs come from stones and rocks and things like that. They're even called the stone faces at one point. But then later on, Tolkien felt that the, they were perverted elves because, you, you know, you have to pervert, you can't, evil cannot exist without being perverted, you know, the whole Augustinian thing. So I think Adar, which is just the name for father in Sindarin, you know, is either, I thought originally he might be Maeglin, who, of course, was the son of Ael, the dark elf. And, you know, he caused the fall of Gondolin. He's the one who told Morgoth where Gondolin was. But Maeglin was, was killed by Tuor. So, but I there's no reason why there couldn't have been an elf who maybe was somewhat perverted in the process of becoming an orc and then escaped or was let out or something like that. And because of that, because I think it's very telling that scene with the orc when he basically... He's blessed. He's he's almost like blessing the orc, and then he stabs him basically. But there's something there, and of course the fact that he he mentions he comes from Beleriand, and obviously the river he's talking about is Sirion. There's something there. I think he's half elf, half orc, basically, and that's why they revere him because he hasn't turned all orc, and so they look up to him for that basically. The Watchtower. Um... It feels very Helm's Deep like to me, and the same with Bronwyn um, helping out like Eowyn. I took it as being a lot of refugees, kind of all huddled together as their towns are being taken over by the orcs and everything. And it's interesting that she says the next town they're going to take is Ostirith, which I thought was interesting. Um, yeah, it did have a bit of a, a metasold kind of Aderas vibe to it, definitely. It's a sad thought to know that all the elves are, are gone there because you don't see any elves. Um... And so, one, they probably all got captured, and then Arondir's the only one left, so they all got killed. I guess there's a chance some of them had already been sent back and maybe escaped. 
Uh, but we at least see three of them. We then see Theo uh, volunteer to go get food, right? And the, his mom says, no, you're not going to do that like any good mom would do. <laughs> and like any bad boy, he goes anyway, and he brings a friend with him. And turns out the orcs, they're there. They're just hiding. And he has to use the sword. And we cl- quickly find out that they're there actually looking for that sword. Um, and so it's it's almost like they could they knew the sword existed. They knew it's being used, maybe. Which at the end, he um, the guy tells Theo that it's not a sword. It's it's a power. Mm. And so maybe they could feel that that sword was being used again, which is why it's been hidden for so long as well. We then cut to Celebrimbor. And we get to see from a distance out of his window the, the tower being built, uh, the scaffolding around. You can see the staircase. The Celebrimbor, um, uh, Elrond scene I thought was really interesting. And um, the actor was almost, he was almost playing it like Bilbo. I mean, he had that kind of really halting kind of thing. I thought that was really interesting. But I love that scene when he says, you look like, you know, he's standing there, you look like your father, you know? And he goes, oh, you knew my father. And he said, oh yes, I met him many times and things like that. And, you know, he's refer, of referring, of course, to Adeyandl, who is now up in the sky as a, you know, as the star and everything. But he was, a, he, at one time, he lived, you know, he was an elf. He was, he's the one that went to the West and pleaded with the Valar to get involved with the fall of Morgoth. With, so, so I thought that was a really interesting scene. I liked the, the look of the tower that he's building for the Gwethi Minden. I thought it was really interesting. It reminded me of that Albrecht Dürer painting of the of the Tower of Babel, you know, of course, and what happened when they built the Tower of Babel, you know? So I think the way they're, they're positioning that is quite interesting. I'll be curious to see how that kind of works out. It really did make me think of um, the Tower of Babel. I didn't, and, and but then when y'all said that, I'm like, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, the Tower of Babel, and then they, right? I mean, what happens? It's greed. It's them wanting knowledge that they don't have, wanting them to reach heaven. Um, and it doesn't work out for them. I saw a tweet, speaking of Elrond, that said, thinking about how this season of Rings of Power is give, it's just giving Elrond some nice things. Dwarf friends, good old Celebrimbor, happiness, so that they can brutally tear it all away from him later in the show. Well, and if you look at the Elrond of, you know, the Lord of the Rings, you, you know, in the Council of Elrond, when he says, you know, I've, I've lived... Because I think Frodo says, you remember that? And he goes, you know, my my memory goes all the way back to, you know, Tuo was my grandsire. And I've seen many defeats. I've seen many defeats, you know, and, and he ha- and he will. He will see many defeats. But he starts out as this optimistic, you know, kind of guy, you know, a bit of a politician and things like that. And yeah, again, his arc will be quite interesting. It will be quite interesting to see how, and it will be interesting to see how Arameo, who I think is a great actor, uh, plays him basically, you know, because right now he is that oh my friend and all this kind of stuff. You know, um, I love when you. In the, it wasn't in this episode, but I think it was the first when you see him mouthing Gil Gallant's speech that, of course, he wrote. Basically, that's great. Can we talk a little uh, Elrond gossip? Um, Elrond um, marries Galadriel's daughter. Yes. Uh, I loved looking up like the ages and all this stuff of the elves because yeah. Galadriel was about 1200 years old before the first age began. And, and Elrond is like 2000 years younger than her. And that's a really long time. Well, the thing you have to remember about Galadriel is Galadriel wasn't invented by Tolkien to, he wrote the Lord of the Rings. He went back and retconned her into the mythology. Elrond first appears in the 1926 synopsis that Tolkien did of the mythology, um, which was the background of, of a poem he wrote that he sent to one of his college professors. And the college professor said, could you basically give me an outline of the mythology? So he wrote what's called the sketch of the mythology, which is, a, which is found in volume four of the book of, Lo- of the um, history of Middle Earth. And that's where Elrond first appears. So he appears in 1926, and then he gets put into the Hobbit. Of course, Rivendell, and he's, you know, kind as Christmas and all that. Galadriel doesn't surface until Tolkien's working on what will become the two towers called the Treason of Isengard. And that's where that character. So when he finished The Lord of the Rings, 
he had to retcon her back into the mythology. So he stopped when he finished Lord of the Rings and he went back to the, what became the Silmarillion. He had to put her into the mythology, basically. And in Unfinished Tales, we have um, the, the history of Galibor, uh, Galadriel and Celeborn. And there are like four different versions. Like Corey Olson calls, calls, calls her Galadriel 2.0, Galadriel 3.0, Galadriel 4.0. So she has a very interesting narrative history in terms of how Tolkien composed her, basically. But if you read the early materials, she's not in the in the sketch. She's not in the Quenta. Um, she only appears in Lord of the Rings. So we're getting to see uh, a lot of Khazad Doom, a lot of Moria there. A lot of it, yeah. Mithrod, and then he, and then he looks at Elrond, looks and he goes, "No, Mithril." <laughs> Is there like a language breakdown to that? James Tauber was was talking about that on the on their podcast. I think Roud is a kind because he calls it gray glitter, and and I think then what Doran tries to do is translate that into into Elvish into Sindarin, and myth is definitely gray because later on Gandalf, of course, is known as Mithrandir, the gray pilgrim. So the myth there is right. Roud, though, is not exactly the right word. And that's why I think Elrond really looks at it and he goes, Mithril, because that ill, the sill, is about gleam and things like that. So gray gleaming, basically. It just sounds better. And of course, it's the word, you know, Mithril. He put it in uh, Google Translate and uh, he got Mithroud out. Which was actually inspired by a, a health drink uh, of the turn of the century called Bovril which is this stuff that people used to drink and everything. And it may have its origins in this story by Edward Bullier Lytton called Vrilia, the power of the coming race, which is about these weird creatures that come to earth to kind of dominate it. And in the book, he created a language. He invented a language called Vrilia, which people actually spoke. It was one of the first conferences where people spoke invented languages. It was at the Royal Albert Hall in the 1850s or so. So you see, there's a if you look at Ring of Words, which is a great book about Tolkien in the Oxford English Dictionary um, by Peter Gulliver, there's a whole thing about Mithril in there, about the origins of it. How long do you think before Elrond breaks his oath? Oh, the oath. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Oaths are very important in Middle Earth. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think eventually... Mm, yeah, it will get broken. I give it half a half of the next episode before before. It gets uh, no, broken. I think it might take a bit longer. It, it just it depends on what happens with um, Celebrimbor and why he has to build this tower so quickly and all this kind of stuff. Because of course Mithril gets involved with the making of the rings and all of that as well. So at some point he's going to have to tell someone. I bet you. He tells Gilgalad because Gilgalad is kind of his boss in a way. And then I think he gets leaked out that way, basically. Isn't Galadriel's ring made of Mithril? Yeah. And of course, later on, we'll have the Mithril coat and all that kind of stuff. There's, so there's a lot of Mithril. We haven't seen a lot of Gilgalad, which I find really interesting after his big, you can all go back to Valinor because I have all this power. That's it, basically. Can we talk a little bit about the Palantirs? They exist. They were made by Feanor, I believe. Um, and I don't I don't recall them. Uh, that Palantir, I don't recall showing the future like that in any of the lore. I could be wrong there. But clearly it's a device to show, you know, interestingly, that that pathway would start with Galadriel. And this is why I think them going to the Southlands is how they're going to bring in Sauron, because in a way, by doing that, they are starting the pathway down to the destruction of Numenor. Um, you know, especially with Farazan, of course, out there trying to get his, you know, people into him, everything, and he'll become the one that ultimately is seduced into the West. So yeah, I don't recall, and yeah, and the fact that I think there was a nice little nod to, you know, what she says in um in Lord of the Rings about the Palantir that, you know, these, these show what may be, but that's her, that's not a Palantir, that's her mirror, basically. So I think they're playing a little bit with the mirror of Galadriel and a Palantir. Yeah, I had that same thought. I had the passage pulled up uh, over here where, where she's talking about 
um, to Frodo about looking into her mirror. Uh, I tried to do some research on her mirror to figure out, but it, it from the book it seems like it's something maybe she put together and it, it works through her. She refers to it, it it's what you hobbits call magic. Um, it's basically, it, it offers an opportunity for someone to look into a, into her mirror and see things that might come to pass is what she says, you know? It's actually one of the source, one of the inspirations from it was, it was a story Tolkien read by H. Ryder Haggard actually um, called She, which had that same kind of device in it. I think it was She, or was it King Solomon's Mind? It was one of those. Um, John Ratleaf, who's an amazing Tolkien scholar, uh, wrote a chapter on it in a book about Tolkien and source studies, actually, edited by Jason Fisher. Um, but that's one of the sources of it, basically. Did we see Narsal? Yes. We saw Narsal. We saw the shield of Tuor with the, with the swan. And we saw the axe of Tuor with the drumbal. I think it's called Drumbalog, which was kind of on the stand there in the tower. So again... They can't mention those things, but for people who know, you go up, oh, yep, that's that, that's that, you know, that. But yeah, that is Narsil. So that is going to be the sword that will eventually cut the ring from Sauron's finger and be reforged as Andoriel, Sword of the West. Yep. When Theo and Arondir were running from the orcs, they were in the woods, and Arondir pushes Theo down, and an arrow misses him. Then he catches an arrow and then shoots it back. So sick. It was awesome. So sick. Um, I thought that the music was great. Yeah. The acting was great. The slow motion the was slow-mo great. The slow-mo was tasteful. Yes. So tasteful. And then they make it to the clearing. Bronwyn comes. They make it to the clearing. And the music there transitions, which I thought was the most beautiful shot, by the way, in the field yeah. that we've seen so far. Um, and then the music transitions and it is disa singing yeah that was yeah that was really cool great transition and i i, I heard that uh the actress that plays disa helped compose that that's awesome and she sung it yeah that just flows like right into her singing uh for the the rescue of the the dwarves that were in the tunnel and that yeah that and it ends up flowing into the the whole climax just that kind of sets the stage for the that whole climax of the episode i love the scene when the, with the old with waldrig i think it's his we're trying to figure out what the name waldrig means but um and, and you know have you heard of sauron <laughs> have you heard of him lad have you heard of sauron yeah waldrig i don't he's not a good guy I don't he's think. not a good guy <laughs> and he is telling theo you're coming with me yeah not good. Not good for Theo either. That's a bad men mentor. You don't want that kind of mentor. Maybe Sauron comes in through Theo. Maybe Theo becomes the instrument that Sauron uses, the innocence. And that's what the blade is doing. That's why when the blood, maybe, so he becomes possessed and he becomes Sauron. I don't know. It's interesting. Galadriel is sent away and she's on the boat to sail back to Middle Earth. And then the leaves start to fall. And we hear this speech. It does. It just. It just kind of is the. Right. It's the. It feels like the climax of the setup. Like right. we've we're done with setup, and now we're into true storyline, true like action. All the pieces kind of coming together. Yep. I did like when you know they they cut and they're asking who will serve, and Sealdor's friends. Well, one of them willingly raises his hand. Yeah. The other one is goaded into <laughs> raising his hand, and then the third person. To say they will go is a sealed door. Yeah. There's a theme of duty a little bit within the episode where Queen Regent Muriel, um, you can see in the scene with Galadriel, she's very empathetic with what Galadriel's saying, and but she, you can see the duty. Like she's, she's like, I can't do this for for Numenor. We we have our like what we're going to do. We can't do this. Um, and so, so that kind of sets a stage for her eventually where the one piece that makes her decide, okay, we will, we will go with Galadriel was the leaves falling and the vision. Um, and so that, that made sense for her character to, to change because of that piece. Cause you could, you see the empathy, but all that to say the duty that she showed there was maybe a bad kind of duty. But then there's the duty that Valandil shows 
of I will go, which leads to so many people yeah. also committing. It also made me just like, he's so mad that he got kicked off the sea guard, but there's always another path. Yeah. So he thought his path was the sea guard, right? And, and, and doing all of that. But there's always something else. If one door closes, right, another will open. Yeah. Um, if you're committed to good, there's going to be another way to make make it happen. Something that I saw on Twitter was somebody asking and doing a poll on what is your favorite storyline in the TV show, show so far? Do you, do you have a favorite? Uh, I, I have kind of said this a little bit, but a Rondier, I think, is a character that that I've enjoyed the most watching and, and seeing his story build. And actually, this episode, the second watch through, um, the first the first time through when he comes in uh, and saves Theo, it felt like, uh, you know what should he be there right now i know like he got sent from adar it's like but it feels a little bit out of place but then i thought about it more and it makes so much sense that he would head straight to the village because if he gets released from there who does he want to go save and who does he want to go see first bronwyn so it makes so much sense that he would go there and i and i i just enjoy how his character is being built right now. My favorite storyline still is the Harfoots and the stranger. Um, mainly because I would like to be one of them. Um, and I'm super interested to find out, um, who the stranger is, what he's there for. Um, they made that, that comment even, uh, at the very end, the, the, um, they asked Theo, um, did you see the, the star fall? And, you know, he said, that's a sign that Sauron is coming and we, we got to be prepared. And so I, I, I know there's a lot more to tell there. So that, that is one of my favorite storylines. Well, just cause I'm interested in how it, where it's going to go. The whole Arandia Bronwen Southlands thing. Yeah. I find interesting because it's, it's not Tolkien. I mean, it's, it's, it's not in any of the Tolkien stuff. We know that that is going to be, you know, they're calling it before door. You know, eventually that will become Mordor. And, you know, this week they did what I I, I, I thought Corey Olson made a really good point on Rings and Realms. And that is, you know, about the map that what we thought was the sigil. And then when they turned it around in the library and it was the map. And it was interesting because it looks like Sauron's original plan was to develop a fortress on both sides of the mountain. So you have Mount Doom, Ordrin, and then you have another fortress, which is clearly going to be Minas Tirith. And of course, what is Sauron's ultimate plan in the Third Age is to take over Minas Tirith. So I think there's a little foreshadowing there. But I'm really curious to see how that all develops, basically, um, because it is so new and original. Um, I also, I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying the Harfoots. I mean, I think the Harfoots are just interesting outside of the whole Tolkien where just they're just interesting characters and they are brutal. Oh my God. You know, the whole left behind thing. And, and I love Lenny Henry. I think Lenny Henry's so good. He's just, but I mean, but they are very brutal and you and poor Poppy sitting there all by herself because her whole family died in an avalanche, you know, it's just like really brutal. And I think it's interesting to think about the hobbits later on in the third age, which is all about being secure in your own little house, your own little village. All the evil is being protected away from you and things like that, They're very insular people. And then you kind of see why, because they, they came from being these migratory people that had nowhere to live, that, you know, had to live off the land, that died, you know, so it's interesting to see kind of, again, it's not Tolkien because Tolkien wrote one line about the Harfoots. But it's interesting. It's you know it, it it does things to your perceptions of the hobbits. I, I'm 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 really interested. I, 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 this has nothing to do with Lord of the Rings, but I was just watching the Obi Wan series on Disney. You know about Obi Wan and Vader and things like that, and and the fact that a very young Princess Leia gets involved. And it's interesting the, how that changes your perception of the original movies. Even though when Lucas made those original movies, none of that was there. So I'm really curious. Uh, I, I love this whole idea about world building and how worlds get built and stuff like that. And so I think that's interesting how the Harfoots make me think differently about what the Hobbits will become. Yeah, I think the same 
with um, being able to see maybe some of the people that end up getting rings of power, maybe the nine Nazgul, maybe, and it being characters that we we actually start to like, and then it's gonna make us it's gonna make us feel something different when we read about it or 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 watch it in the Peter Jackson films. They're gonna make us fall in love with these characters, and then because I, I mean Theo, I mean come on, he I mean he's got the thing on his arm and all that already. He's probably the witch king of Agmar in training or something like that. But yeah, exactly. You know, we, we, these uh, a lot of these mortals, you know, what happens to them? They're going to get, we know what happens to uh, to Kelly Brimbor. It's in the text. They're building the tower of the Gwaithi Mirdan right now. We know what happens on that staircase that they're building. So it's all coming, you know. Um, and that's what I find fascinating about how it's going to span out and how they're going to do that. Who do you resonate with in Tolkien's literature, in Tolkien's world? For me, it's the elves, just because I love the language. I study the language so much. I, I feel like I live inside Elvish sometime, you know. You know, um, and for me, I mean, the standout of episode four for me, I mean, I literally wept when I heard it, is when Robert Arameo, who's brilliant, I think his Elrond is so good, when he delivered that speech to Doran about his father, about Arendil and how, you know, and looking down on him and all of that. And I just, it just, it really created this depth in his character, you know, because again, the fact that, you know, your father is the greatest hero of Middle Earth and he's floating above the sky there looking down, but he's never going to talk to you, you know? And, you know, Tolkien himself lost his father you know, when he was very young and then, of course, lost his mother. He was he was an orphan by the time he was a teenager. You know, and I think there's a lot of Elrond. There's a lot of Tolkien in Elrond. And I love the fact that I was reading an interview with Robert Arameo and he, you know, he's he's done his homework. He studied Elrond. He's read the, the history of Middle Earth and the fall of Gondolin, you know, so he knows what he talks about. So, yeah, I, I think th I love the elves. I, I've always resonated with the elves. I think they're uh, amazing. They're very tragic, too, you know, because they have what's called serial longevity. You know, they they have this they don't die. You know, they they kind of live on forever. And that's why, like when he says, even for an elf, 20 years is too long and things like that. It's a very different perspective from a mortal, basically. And, and I love that. And of course, then they go to the halls of Mandos and get reborn. So yeah, I so because of the languages, and for me, you know, I always go back to what Verlin Flieger refers to as her favorite bump, bumper sticker, which is when Tolkien said, "Mythology is language, and language is mythology. The tongue and the tail are coeval in this world. It all starts with the language." You know, it's Tolkien said, "For me, it starts with the name, and the story follows." You know, and that's what the elves are all about. I've been reading a little bit more about the languages. Um... And so I was wondering what what your thoughts were on why there why does there need to be two languages for the elves and what's the the functional purpose of that? Tolkien was basically inspired very early on. I mean, the the first inspiration when it came to the elvish language invention was Tolkien's discovery of Finnish in about 1911, 1912. He he uh, he found the the Finnish myth cycle called the Kalevala. Um, which are all the Finnish stories, basically, Vinamoinen and Kulervo. Uh, and he didn't like the translation very much by Kirby, so he tried to learn Finnish uh, and he, when he was at Exeter College. And he, be, he, he fell in love with Finnish. He, he, he described it as like finding a new bottle of wine. It just had it did just this lovely sound to it and everything. And so he was working on a, a kind of inventing a Germanic language called Gautisk, and he kind of put that aside and he started inventing kind of along with an adaptation he tried doing a part of the Kalevala called Kulerva, which Dr. Flieger published, actually. Um, he started inventing a language called Kenya, which was the earliest form of what would become Quenya, which phonetically was very inspired by Finnish. Later on, as he started writing the Book of Lost Tales, which is the earliest version of the mythology, he wanted to invent a language for the Noldoli, who would later become the Noldor, which is what Galadriel is, basically. And he was very inspired by Welsh for that because Welsh was a language of exile. You know, they, they, they were the Welos, they were the, the exiles by the Anglo-Saxons and everything. So he invented another language called Gnomish, which was very inspired by Welsh. It had things like consonant mutations and things like that. That would later develop into 
Quenya, which became the high elven language. So the language that we hear, um, like Elendil says to Galadriel in this last episode, peace to you, that's in Quenya. And the language that was first Gnomish and then became known as Noldorin and then eventually became known as Sindarin was the Welsh inspired language. And then what Tolkien, because Tolkien was at heart a philologist. Tolkien was interested in how languages develop and how languages grow. And he was very interested in how languages get reconstructed back to their sources. So when you think of something like our language, we can trace English back to a language called Proto-Indo-European, which is a reconstructed language. It didn't really exist, but you use techniques and philology to kind of trace back new sound shifts and things like that. Tolkien wanted to do the same thing with his languages. So he created a source language called Common Eldarian. And in the mythology, of course, the elves wake up in the east in Quivienen by the waters of awakening. And then they go on this migration to the west and some fall out at different points. And that's how the different languages of the elves get developed, basically. So he was very interested in being able to trace that back. And so that's why when people say they want to study Tolkien's languages, I always say, well, what version do you want to study? Because Tolkien never invented one Elvish language. We do not have a complete dictionary and grammar like we have, let's say, for Klingon with Mark Orcran, who created the Klingon dictionary and Klingon grammar. We have phases of language invention by Tolkien, starting from that earliest period, almost to the day he died. I mean, he worked on it up to the 1970s. And so when people try to create Elvish, what they, they wind up doing is conflating different phases of language invention to try to kind of create a homogenized language. But that's not what Tolkien was interested. Tolkien actually said in an interview that, no, 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 I, would, I wouldn't mind people knowing about Elvish, but I wouldn't want chaps speaking about it. Besides, Elvish is too difficult, and I haven't finished it yet. And he never did. So what we hear, and so far I know that, you know, what's being used in Rings of Power is pretty canonical Elvish that comes from the sources. But even there, I think, you know, the people who are doing it are picking from different phases of the language invention. Um, that's, what, that's what turned Tolkien on, how languages develop and work and things like that. His idea of fun was, you know, coming up with a new way to, you know, express the past tense, let's say. And he would, you know, I, I, I always call, I call it linguistic riffing. He would just start like riffing on a piece of paper, a conjugation or something. I mean, and we have all this. We have tons of papers. I mean, they're still being edited by the Elvish Linguistic Fellowship. We have tons of papers of Tolkien's language invention. More to come, actually. So, yeah, so it, it wasn't about inventing one language or two languages. It was inventing a system of languages and how languages develop and grow and can be used for things like naming to give them consistency. Because Tolkien said by doing that, it created a sense of historical depth, for example. So words had rootedness. There's a couple moments in the Rings of Power that they, they speak different languages that, that aren't given subtitles. Have you, have you looked at those and analyzed them? Yeah, the one, that I'm, uh, the one that's I'm noodling around uh, from this week's episode was the uh, Nampak, the, 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 um, the, the, the orc, so black, there isn't a lot of the black language. I mean, Tolkien did invent some words. We have the ringing inscription for, you know, Ashnaz, Debatical, Ashnaz, Gimbatul. We have some words of the black language, but I have not found the word Nampak. And I think looking at that scene again tonight, I think it might meant to be like almost like an orcish blessing because it's said on the guy, you know, the orc that just died, basically. So Nampak might be some blessing or something maybe but there's nothing in the canon for Nampak at all and yet it's in it's in that scene it's in Bam McCrory's um in the lyrics from one of the the musical scores so they're definitely playing around with the language a bit but again it sounds like black language it has the the consonant like that you know you hear the word ishi a lot for example that is a, a black language word, basically a word that was invented by, um, well, Melkor, because Melkor invented the black language. He was a language inventor himself. What is your hope for the show? Um, what do you, what do you, what do you hope uh, comes from five seasons, maybe more, of new Lord of the Rings material? 
personally, I hope it gets more people to read the books and to explore like you guys are doing, you know, studying Tolkien and, and diving into the lore. Um, and I hope it gets people thinking about adaptation and, you know, doing papers and, you know, publications on that. Um, I hope for the series itself that, you know, it really does contribute to the canon of Tolkien adaptations like the Peter Jackson film did. Um, I think everyone who's making it is coming at it from a point of view of really wanting to do a good job. I mean, you know, the way they've engaged with the fans and stuff like that. I think the actors like, you know, Robert Arameo, for example, who studied all, all the lore and everything. So these are Morpheus Clark, et cetera. I think these are people who really care about what they're doing. Um, I hope it doesn't get too nuts with some of the story. Why? I mean, the five years is interesting because you, you know, usually with these things, if you look at something like, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm watching House of Dragons now and the game, you know, and they're building arcs basically. And I think with this, it's interesting because they've got to build those arcs over the five years, but we know where it has to end. We know it has to end with the last lines of elves and men on the, you know, the slopes of Mount Doom, like you saw in the Peter Jackson film. So they've got a lot of space to cover in between those two things with lots of characters and things like that. But I think they've got a plan for that. Um, I think it looks visually, it looks amazing. I mean, Numenor looks incredible. And the, you know, you could tell they've, they've built a lot of that set and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I saw something on Twitter early. Someone said, I can't wait to see the behind the scenes, you know, documentary on the making of this. I'm hopeful as long as that, as long as it comes from that kind of idea of really digging into the lore and, you know, creating that kind of arc and things like that, I, I feel good about it. And I like the fact that people are talking about Tolkien, you know, debating about Tolkien. And lots of young scholars are getting more involved with Tolkien. And, you know, if they get involved with Tolkien, they might read C.S. Lewis, they might read some of the stuff that Tolkien was inspired by, like William Morris and Lord Dunsany and H. Ryder Haggard. And then we have, you know, when Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings in the 50s, there was no fantasy section of bookshops. They didn't exist. Now you walk into a bookshop and it's, you know, walls and walls and walls and walls of fantasy literature. Um, that's all because of people like Tolkien, basically. So there's a lot to explore. And that's why it's amazing that, you know, Dr. Feeney has set up this, this center at the University of Glasgow to study fantasy and speculative literature. And, you know, and out of that is coming lots of publications and conferences and PhDs. You know, I was her first. Um, and now she has, you know, a whole army of PhD students. And that's amazing. So, yeah, I, I, I feel very optimistic about it. And if more people read Tolkien, it's okay with me. My girlfriend just bought it last week and began reading. So I know for sure The Rings of Power has brought one new reader. Excellent. I would love, I would love, I think Peter Jackson said this about the films. I would love to like be able to take a pill or something and make me forget about the first, you know, so I could read Lord of the Rings again for the first <laughs> time. I tried recently with the new edition that came out with those. And it's so hard to just read it as a story, because I'm I'm looking for things, I'm like you know things like that. So it's tricky. I I I'm going. I'm at Moria again, and now I'm reading History of Middle Earth again for another project I'm working on. Um, but yeah, being able to read Lord of the Rings for the first time, wow, that must be amazing. Some other things that aren't in the show, but I just got to thinking about uh, just thinking about Second Age and characters um, from the books, from the movies as well. Uh, so I started thinking about Shelob. And I looked it up, and Shelob is alive in the first age and is in Sirith Ungol in the second age. Ungoliant is alive in the first age, and Shelob is a child of Ungoliant. My brother in law reminded me um, of Ungoliant. And um, we didn't get to see any of that with the, the trees in Valinor, but what can you talk about Ungoliant a little bit and, uh, and her role? Well, yeah, Ungoliant was the big bad that, you know, again, they don't have the rights to talk about what happened in the Silmarillion, but in Galadriel's, you know, opening thing, it talks about the darkening of Valinor. And what happened there was Morgoth, at the time Melko or Melkor, teamed up with this um, dark spirit in the form of a spider called Ungoliant. 
and he made a deal with her. He said that if he if, if she would help him destroy the two trees, he would give her the the jewels and things like that to digest. What I love about that too is it literally the next line says like he laughs to himself because he knows he's not really going to give it to her. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and he tries not to, but boy, he pays for that. Um, and then on a day of festival, when all the valor are on Tanekotul, you know, doing valor festival things, they sneak in and they destroy the two trees. Um, and that's what you see in that scene with the blackening of the two trees and the kind of the shadow of Melkor and Morgoth. And then they go up and he steals the Silmarils, of course, from, um, from Feanor. And she wants to eat the Silmarils and he kind of holds them back and he gives her other jewels, basically. And she kind of belches out and stuff and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, she was his partner in crime, essentially, in destroying the two trees. Okay, so my brother-in-law is reading the Cimmerillion for the first time. Mm. Can you... So he's about, I don't know, he's probably 15 chapters in, 10 chapters in. Can you give him some encouragement uh, to keep going? Is there anything later in in, in this that's that... That, that you can encourage him on that he's going to want to see. It's all worth it for the tale of Beren and Luthien and the tale of Tor and Tarambar and the fall of Gondolin, those great tales. I mean, you know, we all know the story of the Silmarillion. It, it is a, it was Christopher after his father's death, putting together a single narrative of all these different versions. And the reason he wrote the history of Middle Earth and dedicated a lot of years of his life to doing that was basically to show where he got all these different parts from, that there were different versions. But you're getting mostly a, a late version of the mythology, the a post 1950s version of the mythology. Um, what I would recommend is actually if there's a wonderful, so Corey Olson did a great guide to the Silmarillion, which is on the Tolkien Professor. And he went through this was years ago. I remember listening to it years ago. And he goes through all of it very slowly because the thing with the Silmarillion, there are no hobbits. There's no there's no frame narrative. You are you are dropped into the Aino Lindale and you have to swim basically. And it you know people kind of refer to it like reading the Bible and stuff like that. But the narrative is, if you think of it as almost like a layered historical document of something that was written probably in the fourth age of Middle Earth, looking back, you know, and that there are other versions of all these stories. And, you know, Tolkien really was interested as a medievalist. He was interested in layers and depth and things like that. So like with the Arthurian corpus, you know, we have many different versions of tales told by different people. And I think the Silmarillion can be seen almost as like that type of historical document, basically. Um, but for me, I mean, the fall of Gondolin in the Silmarillion is brilliant. Sauron. If you want to really read Tolkien firing on all thrusters, read the fall of the fall of Gondolin in the Book of Lost Tales, the, which is the first two volumes of the history of Middle Earth. That was written right after he was in World War I, and it is stupendous. I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Andrew Higgins for joining us today. I know I personally learned a lot. Uh, from listening to you. I could sit here and just listen to you talk all day long. Genuinely hours. Right? We could we could be here. This could be a 10-hour episode, and I would be so happy with just hearing the knowledge. So I hope you'll be on with this again. My sister sent me something the other day from Build-A-Bear. They have a whole line of Lord of the Rings-themed Build-A-Bears. And I got uh, Smeagol. I got Gollum. Who knew um, he could be so cute? I didn't know that he could be that cute. I uh, genuinely like this. Uh, they have everybody. They've got Frodo and Samwise and uh, and Gandalf. Uh, and you can, you know, you don't make it yourself like in the store. Uh, I ordered this one, but they uh, they order it, stuff it for you. It's got Lord of the Rings stamped on the bottom. Um, and so I... I'm glad they're doing this, and I hope to get uh, some more of the little stuffed animals. That's great. I, the first night I had him, I actually slept with him in the bed. Uh, did he Did he try to strangle you? No, or? he didn't. He he slept the whole night. So um, but You're with Smeagol. Yes. I have not uh, had a stuffed animal in the beds. So I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember the last time. Uh, so, uh, But he did spend one night, and now he lives back here on the shelf uh, with me. 
Thank you for watching and listening to Across the Sundering Seas. Our podcast is now on YouTube and just about anywhere that you can listen to podcasts. Um, I even had someone request for us to be on another platform, and that was really easy for, for us to set up. And so if, if you're wanting to listen to it on your preferred platform, just send us an email to across the sundering seas at gmail.com. Another thing that really helps us is if you like, share, subscribe, um, you know, push the down vote if you don't like it even, <laughs> uh, have an argument in our comment section. All of those things help. Um, and so we're not here to get views really. That's not really what we're doing. We're here to, to learn and, uh, to be able to geek out and talk Tolkien and, um, study and enjoy the rings of power. So again, thanks for joining us this week on our episode of across the sundering seas. We'll see you next time.